Welcome to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for joining us. It is Monday, May 1st, 107 this afternoon. We're looking at temperatures outside. Lower 50s, finally. Oh, we've had 50 before. It doesn't feel like 50, though, with the wind. Oh, man. Warmest temperature this year. Name it. Uh, warmest temperature Five, this year. Four, it was uh, 64 three. degrees. It was uh, two weeks Close. ago on a Thursday. Close. 62. 63, 63 degrees. 63. There, there we go. go. I was really close. Just keep going up number. I was just dancing so around it, right. it by like a number. Last time we hit 70, we got 70 in the forecast this oh. week. Oh, oh, I know that one too, Bridget. Oh. Do you know? What? When was the last day we hit 70 degrees and how, how long ago was that? It was a long time ago because I heard you guys talking about it in the office. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was, 181 days. It's 181 days ago today on November 1st. We hit 70 degrees. Happy birthday, 70 degrees. Yeah. Oh, right. look, there's another airplane. <laughs> wow, they're Focus, all over dude. the place today. Focus. Hey. I didn't think they'd be flying. It is really windy out there. It's a kind of a bad hair day. It's Dean a, told me I can't talk about that, it's though. It's a bad flying day. <laughs> It is. <laughs> Dean you, wouldn't know. You know what's <laughs> awesome about today? Today is May 1st. It it's is May the, Day. It is the kickoff to May is Beef Month. Our favorite things, beef and booze. Here we are. It's a good. Well, we'll have good grilling weather later this week, too. We will. Finally. Spring is here. LRC, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. That first week in May, we'll flip the switch. We'll start to turn the uh, corner into spring, and sure enough, now, are we done with the morning temperatures being no frost potential, <laughs> freeze potential? No. 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 So we're not totally flipping the switch in terms of that. Average last freeze, third week in May? I would vote for third week in May. Okay. Memorial Day. But I'm not surprised. Well, we've had freezes and snow as li- late as close to Memorial Day, right. so that's not a surprise. We've gotten snow in June before. Yes, we have. The beauty is, though, from my perspective... We don't have crop in the ground yet, and if we did have a third week of May freeze, a lot of that crop wouldn't be up yet. We're just getting started. Speaking of crops, I, my seedlings are coming out of the ground. Oh, looking yeah, nice under your grow lights. Great, sweet. I got my little trays hooked up there. The grow lights are on them, giving them 14 hours of direct light every day. I will take you to my favorite greenhouse after I buy mm-hmm. all my stuff, and you can have what's left over. That's all right. I, I got all <laughs> the perfect hybrids I need. I was actually really excited. I just got this new pepper. What? King of the North, a- and it's a bell pepper. Like a green bell pepper? It's green and red. It's red when it's ripe, oh, but you can eat yeah. them green. This is huh. they don't lose their sweetness based on the color. It's they, they sweeten when they're green, but they do eventually turn red. We'll be the judge of that. Right. I'm really excited for them. <laughs> they they have a really short growing season too to like match like that's why they got their name King of the yes. North. It's because they're designed for the colder climates up here and they're more resistant to the fall temperatures. Okay, you bring your new peppers, your King of the North, and I will bring my early girl tomatoes that I like because they're nice and thick. So if you're canning, making pasta sauces and stuff, and mm-hmm. Dean just wants us to cook. That's all he cares about right now. Oh, my goodness. Do you hear how noisy it is? Is yeah. that going through the microphones? I don't know, but it is so windy. It, I can hear it. That's the flagpole Jacob, is it going through the microphones? It is really loud in here. <laughs> yeah. That wind outside is whipping. It is. I walked in the studio, and I thought, are the semis that loud on I-29 I was thinking today? the same thing. I had to take my <laughs> headphones off. I'm like, is it? traffic that louder <laughs> no it's just the wind pelting the building at 40 miles an hour and i don't think we really touched on that forecast yet dean when is this wind going away it'll start to diminish tomorrow all uh, right tomorrow winds, winds will lighten up a little they won't be as bad as today and uh, we'll see more sunshine tomorrow after highs in the 50s today around 60 tomorrow and then as we head into wednesday and thursday those are our pick days of the week highs both wednesday and thursday around 70 winds will be a little breezy out of the south but not that bad so if you have any uh well outdoor plans outdoor, outdoor plans maybe i'm flying a, a kite right after this yeah. <laughs> well hang on tight you, you might it might take you away right don't i have like a 10 pound test it'll snap fine <laughs> 10 pound twine there we go yeah so warmer this week. That's finally. Finally, we're talking about the spring Good. spring weather. I got to go back to next week for a second, because if we all remember Friday, we had Darren Hamill, who was on with us, and he runs a USDA center in Fort Collins, Colorado, where they keep mm-hmm. seeds. And as much as we want it to be the top secret service seed bank. He did not work for the, the Switzerland bunker right. or the Ant- the Antarctica bunker. Nope. We, we wanted it, but no. And after the show, we had a couple questions. One was... 
at that facility in Fort Collins, do they store rare or significant wild bird species like fertilized eagle eggs? And two, since we now have the emerald ash borer bugs eating trees in the area, are they storing seedlings of any of those trees in case the bug damage got to be too much? Daryl sent us answers. And so nothing really for the endangered wildlife species except the coral example that he gave us and a few rare or endangered plant species. Again, his focus is primarily agriculturally relevant crops and animals because they are actually storing uh, semen and eggs for a variety of livestock. And he said they do store tree species, especially timber, fruit, and nut species. So there we go. All the things that are being saved for us for perpetuity. I'm going to switch on over to a weather weather thing because I just... What's a weather thing? I just remembered it that uh, hurricane season starts in 31 days. Hold on to your hats. Hang on to your hats. Man, it feels like we're in a hurricane today. I can't can't get over how windy it is. (laughs) The other thing was... Is hurricane season starts in 31 days. I feel like that season never ends. Well, you would think so. And you guys can predict it because you use the LRC. Indeed we can. Yes, you'd be right on. Now, when we go out later today and we spend some time at Peterson Farm Seed, which is indeed one of our sponsors for the Here We Grow project, which we are doing our 20 acres of soybeans. Again, you might want to hang on. I'm not sure that we'll be indoors the whole time, but it could be a bit breezy. And yeah. Peterson... They are the region, region's largest independent seed company. They provide corn seed, soybean seed. And when I talked with the salesman who we're going to be visiting with up there today, he mentioned that they might be running some peas, which would be food grade peas for planting. So it's not like they're being processed to be sent out to the grocery store or anything, but they would be going out to plant in the ground. You think we'll be able to cut a deal with them to bring some of them seeds home and try them out in the garden and give them a little uh, report and see how well they did? Bring cash. I gotta bring cash. They should be paying me to do that. <laughs> this is hey, this is a profitable business. If not, it was volunteerism. <laughs> well, they ain't gonna get the data from me then. <laughs> they you, got someone else to do it. You negotiate all on your own. I'm, I'm out of that. See what one. we can figure out. But yeah, I'm excited to head over to Peterson Seeds and uh, I want to see how it goes. Yeah. I have an idea for you. Ah, uh, for Dean. Uh oh. So our other uh, sponsor I want to mention is Ellingson Drain Tile. And Ellingson, located just north of Fargo here, um, because we know what a crucial role water plays in yield performance. And I saw a lot of Ellingson tile pumps running today as I was driving in. And I thought, I just need a video of Dean with his, like, shower cap on and a bathrobe headed to a tile pump. <laughs> like, he's going to get a bath <laughs> in the ditch. <laughs> That's my idea for when we do that sponsor There's video. There's a pool and a pond. A pond is good for you. <laughs> just bring your floaties and, like, an inflatable right. lawn chair. I've got somebody has got an inflatable kayak. We can, like, I see you have an inflatable kayak. Wait, 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 wait. An inflatable kayak. <laughs> no. You never heard of an inflatable kayak? They make an inflatable kayak. That's a raft. Yeah. No. What? Yeah. No. No. It's a raft. I'll bring it in. Bring that jumbo unicorn you did a video it's with. That. Yeah, yeah, we want yeah. the Infl- You've never seen inflatable kayaks? No. Yeah. What? Well, why would they make an inflatable kayak? Just get a kayak. In case you don't have the room to store it? They make collapsible ones. It's called a f- raft. It's, 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 a, inflatable, it's a boat. It's, infl- it's an inflatable kayak. I don't believe any of this, but things Next thing we- you're going to tell me, they make inflatable couches. You guys live in Barbie houses with Barbie furniture? That's what, where we're headed to. <laughs> Goodness. All right. Uh, well, should we switch on over to a ag topic, a little what serious you, for a minute? What you got? Oh, what, what you do know, I, got? I always <laughs> love talking about the Ukraine and what's Okey going doke. on over there with all the uh, nonsense. <laughs> Three countries ban Ukraine grain imports. They have because... Okay, so a little history here. Mm -hmm. Russia invaded Ukraine, in case you two missed that. I forgot that part. Right, I thought I'd bring it up. Uh, But now Ukraine is having trouble with the grain that they raised in 22, getting it moved out of their borders. Because if you think about Russian control over Mm -hmm. the Black Sea, there's a lot of infrastructure damage yet. So they've been trying to move it into localized countries like Poland, Hungary, Slovakia. But Hungary is the third country to say, stop sending us your grain. They're flooding our markets, depressing our costs. And so honey, as well as some of our... Uh, their meat products, et cetera, are the latest things that have been added. And so that is a bit of a problem at this point. We are hoping to see that they are all able to resolve those issues and just use those countries as um, like a bypass in order to move it out and into other markets. But 
that is a concern right now with some depressed prices over there. Hmm. That's interesting. No, I, I thought they had an agreement to be able to ship the grain and all that out. Dean, they have an agreement. <laughs> there has been a short-term deal through the UN with Turkey that is set to expire mid-summer. I want to say July. And I think they are still doing some of it, but the ships were really slowed because Russian inspectors had gone from 10 ships a month down to about four. And that was even back last fall in October. And I don't think things have sped up real soon. Okay. So mm. they're I, I see what it. they're doing over there. We're going to... We are, we'll let you send your grain out. We'll agree to this. We won't do anything, but we're going to inspect your ships to make sure they have grain, and we're just going to do one a month. <laughs> Downside is planting for them. Um, stories of, from Ukrainian farmers. They run out of the diesel for the tanks. 35 bucks a gallon for diesel for oh. your tractors. You're having trouble bringing in replacement tractors for the ones that got bombed. Seed is tight, those types of things. So they're only going to plant a fraction of the acres that they planted last year oh in Ukraine. So it's a mess over there, kids. dollars a gallon? Yeah. yeah. Oof. You might want to continue to plant more corn acres in your garden. I think there's think a market for you. all think 350 a gallon gas is bad. <laughs> it's not pretty. Ooh, man, it could always be worse. It could, and we could compare that note with our guest today who's joining us very soon. That is Dr. Kevin Fulta, and he is with the University of Florida. We're going to talk about mRNA vaccines in livestock. A lot of talk in the news about that. Truth or, and Or I don't myths. know if I want to call it news, but we'll <laughs> call it social media. How's yes. that? <laughs> and that's why I got Kevin, because he has made a great amount of his time dedicated to not only his work at the University of Florida, but then also just dispelling those myths on social media. I mean, the poor guy has gotten roasted in a lot of ways, but he's right. He's a scientist. He's not some you know attorney with a billboard trying to tell you what's the truth. He's actually got a plan. And we're going to talk to him about that and all of his research and things. And we'll be able to do that. And then stay with us. We'll be back in order to, to visit with Dr. Kevin Fulta next. They'll have you laughing right along with them. They're Bonnie and friends. I have trouble without a picture menu at a Mexican restaurant because they've got so many things to offer. And I don't know. And then I'll describe it to them and they'll go, oh, that's a binkata bunkata. Oh, good. That's what I'll take. You should just ask for the children's menus. There are far <laughs> fewer options. You'll get about eight options. Just point at the chicken fingers and fries and you're good to go. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. Bonnie and friends. Catch them weekday mornings beginning at 5. Hi, I'm news correspondent Bob Woodruff. In 2006, a roadside bomb struck the armored vehicle I was riding in while reporting from Iraq. I sustained a life-threatening traumatic brain injury. The military term, got your six, means I have your back. And that day, our service members had mine. During my recovery, I learned firsthand the challenges facing our service members who return home with injuries. While serving, their fellow service members always had their six. Now that they're home, it is our turn. We started the Bob Woodruff Foundation to make sure that the camaraderie and support they relied on in the military carries on, and we need you. Please join us as part of the Got Your Six initiative and help us be there for impacted veteran service members and their families. They've had our backs. It's time we have theirs. Learn more at gotyoursix.org. That's gotyoursix.org, using the number six. How long is the warranty on your car repair? Hi, this is Matthew Carlson, owner of Fix-It Ford Auto Care. Every qualified repair at any of our three Fargo, Moorhead, and West Fargo locations is now covered by our extended five-year, 60,000-mile warranty. Yes, you heard that right. Five years or 60,000 miles. Peace of mind, just one more reason to choose Fix-It Ford Auto Care. Ask your service advisor for details. Fix-It Ford Auto Care, the name you trust for car repair. Fix-It Ford Auto Care. Windows can quiver, dogs get excited, plants duck for cover, small children climb into beds between their parents. Mother Nature treats North Dakota a little different than most states. She likes to show us her power, and honestly, she's pretty awesome. Springtime in North Dakota can change quickly with thunderstorms swooping in and spitting water bullets like a machine gun. If your windows and doors are older, you'd be surprised how much energy you're losing and how much money you could be saving. We'd love to show you windows and doors that will improve the beauty of your home and are more energy efficient. I'm Andrew, the manager of the Window and Door Store in Fargo. And I'm Jaden. Our team of window and door specialists will meet you anywhere and whenever it works best for you. Every single homeowner we've sold windows to got our lifetime guarantee on the installation of their windows. We'll give it to you as well. 
Call us and schedule a no-obligation, no-pressure estimate. Even if you only want one or two windows, we'd love to show you our windows and doors. The Window and Door Store in Fargo. Better windows, better doors. We've all heard the big news. Fox News fired Tucker Carlson. And now Newsmax is conducting an urgent poll asking you if it was right to fire Tucker. Newsmax also wants to know if you want Tucker back on TV. It's easy to vote in the Newsmax poll. Just text. They'll instantly send you the poll. Text the word ZONE to 39747. ZONE to 39747. I voted. You can too. Let your voice be heard. Text the word ZONE to 39747. And remember, millions of Americans are making the switch to Newsmax. After Tucker, you have a great reason to watch Newsmax every night. Rob Schmidt, Eric Bowling, Greta Van Susteren. Even President Trump says he likes Newsmax. I agree with him. So stand up for Tucker. Text ZONE to 39747 now. ZONE to 39747 right now. And vote. Text ZONE to 39747 now. And watch Newsmax every night. You'll love it. Welcome back to WDAY Weather and Ag in Focus. I'm Bridget Riedel, Ag Director, along with Chief Meteorologist Dean Wysocki, Meteorologist Extraordinaire Justin Storm. Yes, folks, that really is his name. And we have a guest with us today, and that is Dr. Kevin Folta. He is with the University of Florida. And we want to get to livestock vaccines and some discussion there that's been going on in the news. But first... Dr. Fulta, tell us all about you, if you would, please. <laughs> well, uh, that's the boring part. Um, I'm, a <laughs> <professor at> the, <laughs> I'm a professor at the University of Florida. I've been here for 20 years. I work mostly in the genomics of fruit crops, which is uh, basically understanding how all of the DNA and genes and things coordinate to give us good traits that can help us make better varieties for farmers. And a big part of what I do is help others learn how to talk to the public about science and train a lot of farmers and scientists and uh, folks who are in industry to be more effective at communicating about agriculture. Oh, I like that. I'm okay with good mm -hmm. communication. So the whole reason this conversation started is there's a lot of rumor mill out there about mRNA vaccines in livestock. And it started out with a statement that National Cattlemen's Beef Association said, we are not doing any in beef. But then a lot of listeners turned around and said, wait, what about pork and chickens? And so could you just give us a little bit, what's an mRNA vaccine? Why are people concerned? What are we doing with them? And I know we have lots of questions. No, this is fantastic. So. I'm really excited about this because as a molecular biologist, mRNA is a central part of what I've studied for 35 years. I've worked with the stuff and I know it inside and out. And I am so excited that these kind of therapeutic um, and vaccines uh, are being introduced. So mRNA. mRNA is what they call the middle step of the central dogma of molecular biology. So let me go backwards. You have <laughs> <Okay>. DNA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's as deep as I'll get. DNA is like the blueprint that's in the center of your cell. It's put away in the nucleus in the library of the cell, and it stays there forever. Think of it like the hard drive on your computer. You don't want to see it. It's put away. It's done. There, mRNA is kind of like a book in that library. It's one little piece of information that encodes uh, one chunk of information about something, right? And mRNA's information then uh, is, is very transient. It's very temporary. That book goes away. But in the meantime, uh, it can be used by the cell to create the instructions to make a protein. So proteins are the things that uh, have function and structure in the cell. So DNA in the nucleus, mRNA is this transient copy of one little piece that encodes for the protein. And in the vaccine, the protein is what induces the immunological response in the animal that's been vaccinated. So by providing the mRNA, we're giving the cell a snapshot of what a piece of a virus might look like. And then that teaches the body to respond to that particular virus. So it's a way of having the body prime itself for infection, thinking that it already saw the virus when it never really did. And, and that's a really nice way to be able to strategically uh, vaccinate livestock and people. And Kevin, are there any are there any downfalls to the mRNA vaccination? If 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 we, 
you know, you've got your pluses, you got your what are the what are the minuses in it? When you look across the board, the, the pluses are also in the manufacturing. It's much easier to, to, to manufacture. It's rapid. You can respond to new variants and new challenges very quickly. So if there's a new variant and a different serotype of, of, of a disease, you can manufacture and scale up very quickly. So that's the, another side of the positives. The downsides are that the delivery of these, we are still learning as we go, right? And you only know when you, you don't anticipate any plausible challenges. Those have all been worked out since the late 1980s. Uh, people have figured out what the downsides are and how to get around them. We saw from the COVID vaccine that there are rare instances of specific things that happen, like myocarditis in young men. Um, there's CVST in uh, women, a type of uh, thrombosis in, in, in uh, specific age group in women. There are different epidemiological categories that we can identify where different rare events do occur. But in general, these are extremely safe and look to be a major step forward in the fight against cancer as well as infectious disease. So you had made a point earlier that these mRNA vaccines that prime the body to be able to build these proteins to fight off the different diseases and whatnot are kind of like a temporary book or a blueprint to that instruction that you were referring to to building that protein. How long do these stay in the system of, say, either a person or a cattle? Maybe it's different. How long does the body understand or have the availability to read that book? Well, let's look at it this way. The, the book is only administered to a small number of cells. You get the injection in your shoulder. Uh, in the animal, you get the same thing in the, in the back in the uh, behind the neck in a pig. Um, they, it's, it's temporary. This is a very unstable molecule. That's why the COVID vaccines had to be shipped on dry ice and had such limited reach in the developing world where we had to, re had to uh, rely on old school vaccination. This is an extremely unstable molecule. It's injected into the, into the patient. Uh, it spreads in those cells, which then produce the protein. Mm -hmm. And then the RNA goes away. The protein is produced. It elicits the immune response that then protects the animal thereafter at least as long as the duration of that vaccine works. Uh, we saw in COVID, maybe that wasn't as durable as we would have liked to have seen. But for other diseases, and especially in animals, looks extremely promising for one shot and you're done. I, I got to follow up with that because I, I had read something. I, I believe that this got misproved, but this doesn't alter or get absorbed into your DNA, correct? Because I know that there was a big thing during the whole COVID thing with people, and, and, and I know we're going to get into cattle about this, mm -hmm. but that the DNA was being altered or it was being added to the DNA. And this was a huge thing or a big deal with the rejection of the whole COVID vaccine and believe in it, don't believe in it. That's your opinion, what you want to believe. But is that is that the case? Was that true or was that misinterpreted? It was absolutely false. Um, there were some data that came out, which we must believe are spurious uh, because they came through uh, in vitro studies on specific cell types, which had alterations, which could possibly allow it to happen. In the patient itself, in the animal or the human, it does not happen. We don't possess the enzymes that are required for that to happen. There are cases in the world, you know, viruses do it, other things do it, where you can't actually stick copies of things back into DNA. But this is a one-way trip, and that's what makes it so cool. The RNA is a temporary copy that's translated into protein. That's it. It cannot go backwards in the animal. And if it did, it would just be in those few shoulder muscle mm -hmm. um, where it was injection, injected. And the other side of this, too. There's a lot of genetic diseases, things like sickle cell anemia that are just a single base change in DNA, a single letter of DNA changes. If this actually did do that, we could solve sickle cell disease for 100,000 people with a shot in the shoulder. It mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. I see. And I know you got a bunch of questions. I know we got bottom of the hour, but something I want to get get answered and we'll do that when we come back but just a little tease for what we'll come back to is that also with this there was a lot of concern that we've been giving these vaccines to cattle and with the SARS and the COVID whatever they were relating this back to a vaccine that cattle were getting back in the 70s or 80s I believe it was and people were thinking oh they're 
they're giving us cow vaccines and all of this is what we were picking up actually the truth that this was some vaccine for cattle or is it completely different and then we'll talk about what that vaccine actually was when we come back is your bathroom looking old and worn out want to update it but you don't know where to start then let bci bath and shower show you how to turn that old bath into an aisle of beauty and functionality our residential bathroom solutions provide the best value on the market and our customer service is second to none our cost-effective bci bath and shower family of products has what you need Remodeling our bathroom was a big decision for us. They didn't make a mess out of our house at all. And at the end of the day, we had a beautiful new bathroom. And it was a great experience the whole way through. We have the best monthly payment programs in the industry, with payments as low as $68 per month, or no interest, no payments for 18 months. For a limited time, be one of the first 100 callers who schedule a free in-home consultation and receive $500 off. Call 800-721-9985 for a free no-obligation price quote. That's 800-721-9985. Factory trained and certified installers made in the USA and discounts for seniors and military. BCI Bath & Shower, the leader in affordable bathroom products. That's 800-721-9985. Hi, I'm Ashley, owner of the Aspire Optical Company. This month marks five years since we opened our doors. Thanks to you, five years of eye exams on site six days a week, five years of uncompared selection of over 2,000 frames, five years of continued focus on all your vision care needs. To say thank you, take 50% off your frame with lens purchase for the month of May. So thank you for your continued support of what I truly believe is the region's premier optical experience. Aspire Optical, eyewear like you've never seen. I can't wait for what's next. Even with higher stroke risk due to atrial fibrillation and a regular heartbeat not caused by a heart valve problem, Eliquis, the Pixaban tablets, reduces stroke risk. It's the number one cardiologist prescribed blood thinner. Don't stop taking prescription Eliquis without talking to your doctor, as this may increase your risk of stroke. Eliquis can cause serious and in rare cases fatal bleeding. Don't take Eliquis if you have an artificial heart valve, abnormal bleeding, or have antiphospholipid syndrome. While taking, you may bruise more easily or take longer for bleeding to stop. A spinal injection while on Eliquis increases risk of blood clots, which may cause paralysis, the inability to move. Get medical help right away for unexpected bleeding or unusual bruising, or if you have tingling, numbness, or muscle weakness. It may increase your bleeding risk if you take medicines, such as aspirin products, NSAIDs, SSRIs, SNRIs, and blood thinners. Tell your doctor about all planned medical or dental procedures. Learn more at Eliquis.com or call 1-855-ELIQUIS. Adopt US Kids presents What to Expect When You're Expecting A Teenager Learning the Lingo GOAT, G-O-A-T, acronym stands for greatest of all time as in spaghetti sandwiches for dinner they're my fave dad you're the goat you don't have to speak teen to be a perfect parent thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same visit adoptuskids.org brought to you by the u.s department of health and human services adopt u.s kids and the ad council Welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for rejoining us. It's 1.34 in this afternoon. We're visiting with Dr. Kevin Folta from the University of Florida. We're myth-busting mRNA vaccines and livestock. And if you'd like to join in on our conversation, ask a question for Dr. Kevin Folta, feel free to reach out to us on the Red Wing Shoes studio phone line. That's 701-293-9000. Again, 701-293-9000. Or you can always reach us via email during or after our shows at weather at flagfamily.com and also ag at flagfamily.com. Now, before we went to the break, we were kind of teasing on a, I remember when this whole conversation of the COVID vaccine came out, they were saying, well, we were given this, this vaccine to cattle back in the seventies or the eighties. And now we're just taking livestock vaccines and shooting them into people. We don't know what's going on with this. What's the miss? understanding or conception on that was was that true are the two things related in any shape or form because they were giving was it was it SARS or I think it was SARS might have been some remnant of that to cattle back in 30 years ago or so wow that, that doesn't ring a bell so SARS and MERS were both since the year 2000 and so these are contemporary coronaviruses uh, along with SARS-CoV-2 so I'm unfamiliar with what they're talking about with respect to these vaccines in the in cattle in the 70s or 80s that that seems a little bit premature okay 
Fair enough. And to reiterate, as we've talked about, there is not an mRNA vaccine that's used in cattle. But what's the difference there with what's going on in poultry and pork production? Well, nothing in poultry yet either. I wish there was. Um, there's some good opportunities there in poultry for a variety of highly infectious viral transmitted diseases. But in pork, there's a number of uh, diseases that are now currently being treated with mRNA vaccines that are rotavirus, also um, a number of digestive disorders, diarrheal diseases of pork, um, of swine. And uh, there's a, two companies that are currently making pork-based mRNA, well, mRNA vaccines for for hogs. Um, that's Merck and a company up in the Dakotas. Like your name just eludes me right now. Oh, hang on. Would but, it be uh, would it be MedGene? Because I have some news about it. them. Yeah. Okay. That's that's it. That's right. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just slipped my mind under the pressure of being on a <laughs> microphone. Um, <laughs> it turns off a funny part of your brain while you're trying to be fluent. Happens to us uh, yeah. every day. Oh yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> So, but, but it's still a very limited application. And the sad part is if you look at the number of things that it could work against, whether it's rabies or uh, a foot and mouth disease, there's uh, avian influenza. There's a variety of diseases that are viral that are in farmed fish that will benefit tremendously from this technology. So for me, it's about protecting farmers and giving farmers the tools to protect their livestock. And, and I think there's so many good things that can come from this technology. So as you brought up Medgene, uh, this is a Brookings, South Dakota company, and they are looking at a flu vaccine for turkeys that can help protect against the avian flu strains, in which we talk about up here a lot. We're next door to Minnesota as number one poultry producer in the U.S. And so this is impactful for all of us. And Medgene's vaccine platform has approval from USDA and is used to make vaccines for swines. So that is one, one positive for our neighborhood. So here's a question for you, Bridget, and also you, Kevin, you might have an answer to this as well. Is there not already a vaccine for bird flu? Because well, I thought that there was some form of vaccine, and I don't know if that was mRNA or not. And if, and if my memory is correct on that, they were choosing not to use it that is a Kevin question. I think he's got probably more up-to-date information than I do. I'll make my opinion, but he's got the answers, I think. Well, I'm unfamiliar of an avian influenza vaccine. And the problem with that is that the avian influenza vaccine undergoes uh, what's called genome shuffling. It, it changes very rapidly in response to um, its continued evolution. So mRNA vaccines are good because they're much more adaptable mm -hmm. versus the old school vaccine where you would have different combinations like they do for human uh, influenza. There was a genetically engineered bird that could not spread the disease. So it could catch it, but it couldn't spread it. Okay. And that was developed in uh, 2011 in, in, uh, in um, uh, gosh, the country that I didn't know, Scotland, <laughs> and uh, and it's been shelved and never mm -hmm. never reached production, unfortunately. So there are there's been ongoing research for quite some time because I wanted to ask, how long have we been working with or talking about mRNA vaccines? And you know, I think most folks think this is relatively new, but the way you talk, Kevin, this has not just started in the last two years. No, there was a cool paper back in the 1980s that showed this, and, and it was very exciting to see that you could inject mRNA into an organism and have it produce the protein. And that was a big step forward. But there are all kinds of funny barriers that happen from immunological or chemical reasons that it just wasn't feasible until 2005. And that's when they figured out how to make this uh, a safe and useful technology that didn't have secondary effects um, in most uh, organisms that it would be used in. And since 2005, there's been an explosion of development occurring in this space, really since 2013. And uh, the, there have been a variety of vaccines against human diseases like Zika, chikungunya, all these diseases, dengue, that are kind of minor in the background diseases where you can't scale up normal vaccine production. And uh, you'll see a lot more of this going forward. And Kevin, how do you fight all the misinformation that's been going on over the last two, three years, especially two years, uh, over this vaccination? It's, it's I'm sh I mean, there's you've got to fight through social media and, and just false information. And how do you, how do you retaliate it or educate people that, you know, this isn't true? Yeah, the, 
the, the problem is, is that it's impossible. It's very difficult to educate people. And as an educator and as a professor, it, it kind of makes my heart a little bit sad because I'm excited by new data and I'm also excited to learn that I'm wrong. But in the social media environment, you find out people don't like hearing that their uh, cherished beliefs are not true. Mm -hmm. And they dig in even harder when you tell them you know, or confront them with good information. And so the only way to fight it is to really talk about what's important to us and why we care. To me, it's all about animal welfare. It's about farmers being profitable. It's about consumers having affordable meat and dairy and egg costs. And for me, those are the most important things. And when I tell people that, they sometimes will say, okay, so maybe this is something that I should be interested in and that you'll never change someone's mind, but you can help them change their own mind. And, sure. and sharing our values is really the first step. That's okay. huge. And and honestly, I think one of the benefits that I want to hear you talk about is that early on you said this can be of efficiency and economic benefit to livestock producers. How so? Because that contributes to what we buy in the grocery store as consumers. So if this is beneficial for the livestock producers, how and why does it affect me when I'm buying my proteins. Sure. Well, look at um, uh, uh, African swine fever virus, which we haven't had here in the States, but uh, caused 50% of the swine herd to be lost in China last year. You can only imagine what would happen if such a virus were to be found here on shores here. And so this kind of uh, virus, this kind of uh, vaccine uh, strategy allows us to be much more agile at responding to new threats. And instead of having to come up with, with giant fermenters of viruses to purify and then scale up and come away with the pieces of viruses to inject into animals, you just put in this little mRNA, which can be manufactured overnight. It just makes the process of responding to disease threats much more agile. And, and that ultimately um, results in better products for animal welfare and better profits for farmers. I got a couple questions for you here, Kevin. Uh, what would you say has been or is one of the most misunderstood or misinterpreted things about mRNA? Yeah, I, I think it is that, that it could be incorporated back into DNA. That's the one big one. The other thought is, is that it's persistent. Um, mRNA, I swear at the damn stuff because, you know, we, we have to use it in ice buckets with super clean baked glassware, everything treated, rubber gloves and not breathing on your samples. I mean, mRNA falls apart if you look at it funny. <laughs> so when we treat it in the laboratory, it's it's very difficult to work with. And I've done it for 35 years. And, and I, I, it's something that I'm very, very comfortable with. So the other thought is that it was persistent. The, the persistence and then moving into DNA are probably the two biggest myths. I see. And we've talked about this on our show a, a good handful of times, and we've had a few guests that have talked about it. Uh, and this is the whole uh, hoof and mouth disease mm -hmm. and that there is a vaccine for this disease, but they don't distribute it right now unless there was an epidemic. If it were to outbreak within the United States, they would disperse these vaccines. Do you know any information about that? Is it mRNA or any insight or knowledge on that vaccine for hoof and mouth? Say it did go on a rampage in the United States. Yeah. So right now, my my belief is, is that my understanding is that it is a traditional vaccine, but there are multiple serotypes of this disease. It's one of these types of viruses that can shuffle quickly and change rapidly. So if you were to use a vaccine on a regular basis, you a uh, impending infection may be able to work its way around it. And, and so I think it's one of these issues where the mRNA vaccine offers great agility, where until there's a disease outbreak and some sort of uh, clear incidence of the disease, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not wise to play your cards. Mm -hmm. So I think we're I standing see. by waiting for outbreak where mRNA vaccine can be deployed very quickly. I see. You guys got any other uh, questions off of your head for Dr. Kevin? And I just want to back up what you were talking about with the foot and mouth disease. That's a vaccine bank that is being built, mm -hmm. but you're right. We haven't had any outbreaks in the U.S. And a reminder to those of you who are coming back from your vacations, thank you for listening to us while you're gone, but don't bring back anything that APHIS, um, the Ag 
uh, ex- inspection services don't have on you and make sure you, if you've been in hog facilities, et cetera, that's why we want you to wash your shoes and your clothing because you can literally bring those things back and cause an epidemic outbreak in the U.S. Yep. Yeah, we won't want, want that at all. No. <laughs> so we got to go out a, about a couple minutes here. Dr. Kevin Folta, is there anything that you would like to mention or bring up that we haven't talked about yet that you would like to bring out to the public? Well, I think the importance of this new technology is that it is extremely agile. And I think you'll see this used in human medicine in many ways going forward. There are companies currently with therapeutics for uh, prostate cancer, which are really advanced, that are mRNA-based therapies. There are therapies which will remove scar tissue from uh, damaged organs like hearts, livers, and kidneys. Those are being developed, and the results in mice and things look fantastic. And this is all just using mRNA to reprogram immune cells to search for a new target. And so you can actually use mRNA to teach a uh, immune cell to attack a specific flavor of cancer cell. Uh, It won't work with all cancers. Cancer is a very complicated disease, but there are some very specific ones where it looks good. I think when we malign the technology and we have people in social media saying this is dangerous, it only will slow the development and the deployment of these useful therapies, which could save human lives too. So let's help our animals. Let's help our people. So I have one point to to give back to Dr. Folta, and that is uh, I heard him do a podcast recently with a mutual friend of ours, Rob Sharkey, uh, with Shark Farmer Podcast. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And he said his youngest child will have a life expectancy of 100 years, and that's due to the things like Kevin just described to us, how that can impact us. So think about that. Your your new Mm -hmm. baby right over there, Justin. He could live to be a hundred. That's awesome. So, yeah. Hey, Kevin, say someone's out there. They're listening. They've been listening to this conversation we've been having all about the biology and how these vaccines work, and maybe it piqued someone's curiosity or their interest, or maybe it's something they want to look into more. If maybe that's a career field that they want to go in, kind of follow in your footprints. Mm-hmm. Where could they go to to get a little bit more information on that, or maybe uh, one of your university pages that kind of talk about your program? Well, I would, I would love to talk more about, I wish I had some good, good examples. The best thing you could do is go to the Merck website and learn about the animal vaccines there. There's some excellent review papers that are available in, in places like PubMed and uh, Google Scholar. If you go in and put mRNA vaccine livestock, there's an excellent uh, review paper in there that breaks it down very well by Lee et al., L-E, and other associated authors. That's a really good first place to start. Awesome. Well, well, thank you very much for coming on the show. This has been awesome. It's been very educational. And I want to thank you for informing and educating me on all of this, because there's a lot of things in there that I just learned about. Nice. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate being able to share the science on this. It's very exciting. Yeah, no problem. I'm sure we're going to come up with a bunch more, and I'm sure uh, some of our listeners will come up with more questions, maybe have you on again in the future sometime. Very good. Thank you so much. Yep, no problem. Guys, we're going to take a look at the American Ag Network, and then when we come back, we'll touch on a few more things, take a look at that forecast again. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Introducing Ambassador Cleaning, your one-stop shop for all your office cleaning needs. Their team of experts will leave your business sparkling clean and smelling fresh. With over 22 years of experience, they guarantee satisfaction with every job, commercial or industrial. No job is too small. Don't waste time cleaning the office yourself. Leave it to the professionals at Ambassador Cleaning to make your space enjoyable and germ-free. Experience the difference. Contact them today at ambassadorcleaning.com. Ambassador Cleaning, one call clean. Cleans it all. It's spring again, and that foundation crack, that seeping water, that bowing wall is still there. But it's not too late. At Precision Concrete Cutters, Ramjack North, we've got you covered. Don't let those problems continue through another spring. Your complete foundation experts are here to help. Call 701 280 7038. That's 7038. Or for a free estimate and to learn more, go to pccnd.com. That's pccnd.com. Mixed activity in the markets at midday. This is the American Ag Network. I'm Jesse Allen with this market update. We're talking now with Arlen Suderman, Chief Commodities Economist at StoneX. Arlen, as we kick off the month of May, got a little strength in the soy complex and wheat a little bit lower with corn seemingly caught in the middle with a little spread trade action, it looks like. What is your take of this grain and oilseed trade as we kick off the month of May? 
Yeah, soybeans trying to hang on to positive values supported by st- some strength in soy meal. Not a lot of strength considering the collapse that we saw last week. Old crop stocks are still tight and will remain that way, probably get a little tighter before we harvest this next year's crop. But other than that, we're really not seeing a whole lot to extend these gains. And considering how far we collapsed down over a dollar loss here um, in late April, uh, these are rather modest gains so far so i'm unimpressed but yet they are showing some resiliency corn trying to hang on but collapsing wheat prices just simply don't make it very easy we're seeing big double digit losses in wheat as the chart selling continues there and seasonal weakness this is a time when wheat prices typically go down into harvest uh, and we've seen a lot of liquidation there now that the rains have fallen in the southwestern plains and the perception is that all is well we may get a little bit of a wake-up call next week when USDA releases its first field-based survey of winter wheat yields in their WASDE report at the end of next week. Again, that's Arlen Suderman of Stone X. Right now we see new crop corn four to six lower with front months mixed around unchanged. Beans three to six higher. Wheat under double digit pressure lower. Cattle and hogs lower with hogs triple digits lower. Crude oil down a dollar thirty nine a barrel, seventy five thirty nine. This is the American Ag Network. I'm Jesse Allen reporting. And welcome to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for rejoining us. It's 1.52 in this afternoon. If you'd like to join in on our conversation, feel free to do so. Give us a call on the Red Wing Shoe Line, 701-293-9000. And I was just sitting here realizing in between our break and our in-depth conversation we were having, I haven't played a single sounder in today's show, so we're just going to... My throw a favorite. couple out there. I and love it. There we go. I got three in today. Okay. And also, I will give a shout out. I know we have a new listener down in McIntosh County today. We had uh, a custom applicator who spread and fertilizer said that they was going to be listening. So yeah, that's awesome. Let us know where you are and what you were doing when you're listening because spring season is just around the corner. We're great and getting rolling. My buddy up in uh, Grand Forks says he throws us on on the. Uh, in his tractor while he's out, although he has yes. been in the shop more than in the field <laughs> lately, but he says now, uh, he turns it on at one o'clock every day. I had guys doing field work uh, in the northern end of the valley, not uh, right in, like, right, not right along the river, but up around that Lancaster, Minnesota area. Mm-hmm. There were some folks that were in the field over the week, like yesterday, over the weekend. And Barnesville, this neighborhood to the southeast of us, they have actually probably the least amount of snow of anybody quite around us. And mm-hmm. so I think they're probably going to be getting in the field here a little bit sooner than most of us. I'm sure that there will be folks to call us on the Red Wing Shoe hotline at 701-293-9000 and say, no, Bridget, you're wrong. I am not anywhere near being in the field well, yet. You're not going <laughs> to, pl- you, you can't plant until you're getting that soil. I mean, soil temperature is at 40 degrees. Yeah. It, forage depth. We so. want it to warm up a bit. Yeah, Can so. you put stuff in the ground at 40? It, I know 50 is the magic number and you don't want to put your okay. seed in cold, wet soil, but is there, are there things that generally get put in the ground while it is colder compared to other crops? You can put it in the ground. It's not going to germinate unless it gets a little bit war- warmer. One of the things that affects like corn and soybeans is a cold shock or a cold water imbibing when they get that cold moisture, mm-hmm. when the seed coat cracks and they take that in and that can actually, it's been proven to show some yield loss when it happens. Probably the most tolerant to cooler temperatures is wheat. And as you guys have talked about on the LRC and including on our website, I read Dean's messages that we're looking at a summer with slightly below average temperatures. So if we're cooler like that, it really sets up to be a good year for a wheat crop as long as we don't get hot during flowering. Speaking of wheat, yo, and we kind of just touched on this just a little bit before our show, that I had heard recently that there was speculation that there was going to be a flower shortage by the year 2024. Oh, yeah. And I'm assuming that has something to do with some of the crop down in Texas and the drought all down there affecting their crop and some areas losing half of it. You're What's not. going on over in Ukraine? But when I heard that, I just shook my head and I'm like, that has to be completely speculative. So you're not talking about petunias and geraniums, I'm right? talking about flower flower. Like <laughs> all bacon purpose cakes, flour? All okay. purpose flower. 
What are your thoughts on that, if, if you want to touch on it? Well, okay, so we've got a little bit of time. You guys have proven that our drought areas of the U.S. have shrunk. We went from mm-hmm. 66% last year. We're down to, what, 40 45% uh, in the panhandle of Oklahoma, West Texas, mm-hmm. up through western Kansas into Nebraska. So it's gotten smaller. It's still very severe in the areas in which it exists. We are also seeing that, just like you said, Ukraine can't quite move all the grain around. They're going to plant less this year. They generally supplied a lot of parts of the globe with a different quality of wheat than what we were producing here in the U.S. Will we run out of wheat? Well, if the price goes up and people plant it, no. I mean, that's that's really what's going to drive the wheat market. That's a good point right there. You know, if we have a low supply, price goes up, Mm -hmm. people want to plant more. Um, and it's there's a variation between the winter wheat market that's really dry in the southwest versus where we all plant spring wheat up here, too. And we continue to raise spring wheat. That's what this region was built on. There's a reason we're called, you know, the Great Plains of Wheat. And we're the home of all the Bonanza farms that started in the late 1800s. So I don't see wheat going away. What about supply from last year? Uh, as would, far as carryover? That, car- yeah, carryover to where we're at. W- it, would that make up any difference in what's been lost this year? Or does that play a role in anything? You are is such a good lead-in, man. just a normal <laughs> amount that we have laying around? Or Here's the deal. We have an expert tomorrow. That'll be David Spickler with Lighthouse Commodities. Let's ask him. Okay. He's a guy who deals in the grain trade on a daily basis. Let's find out. All right. I mean, I will be looking forward to that to get gi- an answer. I can give you my never to be humble opinion, but that doesn't seem to be <laughs> worth it. So we'll just give it an expert to tell us. <laughs> experts usually do best. Speaking of experts, weather, gentlemen, what's it look like? Well, I'm no expert. I'll let Dean handle this one. <laughs> wow. I was, oh. I, see, I was going to toss it. I'm no expert. I'll just toss it to Justin. Only, right. but, but hey, you know what? All right, we'll take it. Yeah, no, we were looking at uh, quite a bit of cloud cover throughout the valley and about 20 miles either side of the valley. A lot of clouds around for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, as we head towards sunset, we'll start to see the clouds break up a little bit with uh, temperatures today stuck in the 50s. Not going anywhere higher than that. With the winds out of the north, northwest, 20 to 35, and gusting close to 40. Um, more like 150. Uh, it feels uh, like uh, 40 <laughs> down about meters it. per second. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tonight, lows in the 30s, and tomorrow, lighter winds, still out of the north, about 10 to 20, but highs right around 60. Ooh. And then right around 70 for Wednesday and Thursday. Did you say 70? Turn to the south. Yes. Yeah. Finally. Finally. First 70 since November 1st. There's and then the there's two bell rings. <laughs> we'll break another streak, maybe. Now Of bell rings or ready, weather? Get, oh, weather. Get ready for the other sounder all right, because which, all right. clouds come back into the area and scattered showers Friday all the way through the upcoming weekend. <laughs> yeah. We can't. We just can't seem to get a good another, weather weekend ah. around here. Just uh, Are they all going to be like this? According to Jay, they are. So he'll be yeah, right. speaking. No. Jay, Jay will be in after two o'clock and just say, "Weather sucks all summer, boys. That's how it's gonna be." Nah, it'll, you know, we're just a bad streak to start off. It's Here's a, a question for you. Okay. I don't got enough time for callers to call in an answer on it, but if you could, in a way, control the weather to some degree, would you take back-to-back winters to get a double summer, or would you just deal with one winter summer and just kind of go back and forth? Or if you could go through a bunch of winters and then just rack up a bunch of summers to play out, would you do it? I need four seasons and planting a crop, kid. Well, well, no. you can just keep harvest, plant, <laughs> harvest, plant, harvest, plant. I don't want to double crop that much. Did you not read the story on social media that once... The- here. So they're gonna they're gonna expand these chemtrail sprains from Stop Tuesdays it. to two days a week. Once they expand that to two days a week, that's when it will start to warm our weather. You were lucky you were standing far enough away. I can't kick you today. Oh, that's when it will start to affect. <laughs> our well, weather. that's gonna do it for us here on Weather and Ag and Focus today. Thanks for joining Weather and Ag and Focus. We're back tomorrow, one to two o'clock in the afternoon. Remember, check us out on Facebook and YouTube. Jay Thomas shows coming up next. AM nine seventy and FM ninety three point one.